Um, I'm Suzanne Stevens. I'm a sleep neurologist working in the University of Kansas, and I'm here to talk about medications for narcolepsy, the old and the new. One of the most important things that I try to discuss with a patient when we're talking about what medications to use is what are your goals? Do you have trouble waking up in the morning? Do you want to go out on a date night with your spouse and not fall asleep? Do you fall asleep while driving home from work? That is the most crucial thing that I can really start with to see where we want to end up. I know where we're starting and I want to see where you want to end up and then um, how we get there. And of course, keep jobs. That's a big one too. A lot of times people are just trying to keep their jobs. So here's a drawing of a neuron. A neuron is how the brain communicates. And I almost want to say the different neurotransmitters are the different languages of the brain because the neurons are a pretty fixed system, but what each neuron releases is different. And so we need to tap into the neurons that we are wanting to change or change the amount of, 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 uh, of neurotransmitters they're releasing. So this is called, this uh, up on the top is a presynaptic neuron. This is the synapse in between the presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic neuron. So the presynaptic neuron, if you can see these little green dots in this schematic, that represents dopamine, which is one of the neurotransmitters that is commonly used in stimulants and helps us in focus and reward system and alertness. This presynaptic neuron is making the dopamine and some of it's getting stored. This is kind of like a storage closet here where it's waiting, waiting to be released. And once it's released, it goes down here, it goes into the synaptic cleft and then finds its receptor on the postsynaptic neuron. So in this, in this kind of example, the dopamine, when it comes down here, has a downward effect of alertness. And this is the same concept in a different format. If you look, this is basically the whole presynaptic neuron, meaning that this is where the neurotransmitters are made. So this is presynaptic and then the postsynaptic is imaginary on the right side of the screen. But if, if, if we're talking about dopamine here, this presynaptic neuron is going through these different, different stages to get to dopamine. And then once it makes dopamine, it stores it. And then when it's ready, ready or needed, it's released and then it, it leaves and goes to the synaptic cleft. Well, this is where a lot of the stimulants work is through dopamine. And I, I focus on this just because it's, it's the most commonly used neurotransmitter, although excitingly we have new areas of, of uh, neurotransmitters that these medications are hitting. But this is kind of the classic one. So uh, methylphenidate is also Ritalin. Ritalin's the brand name. And what this does is it, it blocks the recycling. So the, the nervous system is very good about reusing things. If there's extra dopamine in the synapse, it recycles it and takes it back to the cell. And so methylphenidate or Ritalin, it doesn't let it recycle and it just is sitting there so it's ready to be used. So there's more dopamine, more alertness. So that's how Ritalin works. Other amphetamine-like stimulants, what it does is it, it doesn't allow the storage of dopamine. So these little storage centers, those are not functional with these medications, meaning there's more free-floating dopamine, so more of it gets released into the synaptic cleft. And then GHB is gamma hydroxybutyrate, which is what sodium oxabates uh, is. And it basically makes the cell not release dopamine, so it's, but it's still making dopamine. So you get this kind of backlog of dopamine in the cell, and then once the oxabate gets out of your system, then all of a sudden it floods, you know, the, the, the neuron goes back to working and it floods this dopamine into that synaptic space. And in theory, that's what we think, how, why people wake up feeling refreshed in the morning after sodium oxabate. These are the transmitters we're gonna focus on today. And the reason I'm bringing this up not to have a neuroscience class, but it helps us understand what we're doing and what, what pathway we're hitting, and maybe for some day to have individualized treatment. So maybe one person needs histamine uh, increased and another person needs nor norepinephrine increase. So we can hit these different pathways with different sources, although they're all interlinked, and a lot of people were not sure which one is the source of the problem at this point. 
and then I've got a bigger, bigger image of this. So this is like the brain split in half. So if you were to like slice right down the middle, like in between your eyeballs, and then this is the back of the brain, this is the cerebellum on the right side of the screen, and then on the left side is the front of the brain, and then this is the brain stem, okay? And it's color, color coordinated, which makes it really easy, I think, to kind of see, and this is simplified, but it gets the point across. The green, let's, that's dopamine, We'll talk about dopamine more, and that's where the stimulants hit. And it's important to realize it goes to the frontal lobe because that's why it's used to treat ADHD because it engages the frontal lobe in, in addition to allowing increased alertness. You'll see here histamine, and this, this blue here, we're gonna talk about that with Wakex later on, a new medication that's been out to treat narcolepsy. It's a novel mechanism, which is really exciting. And then, you'll see that in this same blue kind of pathway or highway, whatever you want to call it, it's a highway to alertness. It's trying to get all these neurotransmitters up to make you feel awake. We've also got serotonin and norepinephrine. And then we have the master. This is in the hypothalamus, the red. This is where hypocretin or orexin, the other name for it, is made and where it's, it's, it's orchestrating this whole beautiful complex of alertness. And you'll see that it has, a, it influences like everything. And so in narcolepsy type one, when this is absent, it's just chaos. And there's nothing telling the system when to release what. I'm gonna start with the stimulants, which just because they've been out the longest. And I put this picture on the bottom right down here of the, the busy, busy of the brain, because I wanted you to remember that for the most part, stimulants they basically like stimulate the whole brain. And so because of that, you get the frontal lobes, which will help with focus, but there's also a potential for more side effects like high blood pressure, increased heart rate, irritability, things like that. Not everybody's gonna get those, but they're, because it's so widely distributed in the brain, that's, that's what's gonna happen at times. And then when we're trying to pick out treatment, again, it depends on the goals. Do you need something to help you really pop out of bed in the morning? Is, are morning times really, really hard for you? Then maybe an immediate release stimulant is, is needed at that time. Or say that it's 4 p.m. and you're leaving from work and you're super sleepy and you don't feel you know, like you could do it on your own, you can take a short acting Ritalin at that point so it'll be out of your system by bedtime. So the four hours like a mountain, like it, it peaks real quickly in your body and then it goes out of your body really quickly. And that downward slope can cause a crash or like a, a really bad feeling for some people where they feel great for maybe an hour or two, but then the crash happens and it's almost worse than the tiredness was before. That's not in everybody, but that's, that's the most common limitation I see with the four hour immediate release. And the eight hour and 12 hour, it's much more measured in how it releases the medication. There's not these peaks and valleys of, of um, levels in the brain. It's very slow and steady, and it goes up and it goes down. And a lot of times with a four-hour form, I'll see blood pressure abnormalities, I think, because it just, it just really rocks the system. It just really goes really high. Um, and then I'll, I'll change them to an eight or 12-hour, and the blood pressure and pulse normalize because it's so slow and measured, and you don't have those rapid changes in the, in the level. Adderall or mixed amphetamine salts have the same concept of four hour, eight hour, or 12 hour. And if you, if you ask which one do you pick first, it, you know, it's, it's kind of a flip of a coin. The, these, some, some of it depends on insurance. And so unfortunately we have to kind of abide by that sometimes, but the four hour forms are generic and generally pretty cheap. The others are a little more expensive but it's basically how much alertness you need in a day. Or should you always have a four hour form on hand? And I, I tell that to people who get sleepy when they're driving or um, just have like by Thursday in the work week, they're really, really feeling it. They have that on hand in case they need it. So they might not take it every day. It can definitely be as needed. In addition to the Ritalin and the Adderall we just discussed. There's other stimulants. Dexedrine is one, and that one, it's been around decades. It comes in four hour form, and that's the mountain that goes up and then it goes down. And then there's an eight hour um, span tools. And then um, Vyvanse, which is at the bottom of this slide, Vyvanse is kind of a, a isomer of Dexedrine, and that one's 12 hours. 
And then desoxin is methamphetamine. I don't prescribe that very much. And then Avicio is amphetamine. So there's different options, there's just different lengths of action, different coverages by insurance companies. That's how we dictate which medicine is right for you. Side effects of the stimulants, again, because they go everywhere in the brain and the brain modulates behavior, you can get headaches, you can get irritability or behavioral change, talking fast. If you have bipolar, it can, it can lean you toward the manic side. If you take it too late in the day or your body just doesn't clear it right, you can get insomnia, high blood pressure, which we monitor at every visit because if it goes high, you're stressing your heart. You don't want to do that long term. Palpitations where your heart feels like it's flip-flopping, you might feel shaky, and then like you've had too much coffee, like you're too stimulated, and a high heart rate. And sometimes we do have to fight these uh, side effects with other medications. So it gives the example of if you have a fast heart rate, to keep it paced instead of having to work hard all the time, sometimes we have to use a beta blocker because you can't go without the stimulant. And then um, what one thing that I'll see is if the if the heart rate is high and the stimulant increases the heart rate, the endurance of exercise is really, really lowered because the heart rate shoots up higher than it should. And so we really watch that in young people in particular. So the, that's kind of the stimulant. So those go everywhere in the brain. A non-stimulant wake, call it wake promoting medication, not a stimulant, but is armadafinil, and that one's called new vigil. And then you have modafinil, which is provigil. The unique thing about this medication is if you tag it, if you like radio label this, this chemical you put in your body, it goes right to the hypothalamus. So it goes right to the sleep-wake center of the brain. So it's very specific in what it does and where it goes, as opposed to the stimulants that are going everywhere. This goes right to the hypothalamus. And it's always kind of a, uh, we're not exactly 100% sure how this works, but it does, uh, we think it increases dopamine. Um, and it's definitely there in the wake center of the hypothalamus. These are great medications. The new vigil, again, is 12 hour. So most people like that better than the provigil because the, just because you take it in the morning and you don't have to think about taking another medication. Some people like the modafinil for the flexibility of maybe taking one a day, or they might need two in a day to get through a 16 hour day. Okay, so this is, I'll repeat this slide, slide later because it's so important. The modafinil, which is provigil, the armodafinil, which is new vigil, and patolescent, which is Wakex, which we'll talk about, they all interact with oral birth control pills and the subdermal contraception because they interact with estrogen and progesterone. And this can lead to the, basically like you're not taking the oral birth control and depending on what you're taking it for, you won't get that benefit. So if you're taking it to not get pregnant, then you might get pregnant if you, if you mix these medications. And that's so important to remember. Um, it does not apply if you've got an IUD where there's like localized estrogen release around the cervix because it's so localized, it doesn't interact with that. But just the birth control pills and the subdermal, like the implants, they basically can get negated. Side effects of armadafinil and modafinil are similar to stimulants. And it's really odd because sometimes I'll have people get horrible, horrible side effects on the armadafinil or modafinil and then tolerate the stimulants just fine. Like they'll take the armadafinil and just feel like their whole body's about to explode and they get like a crushing headache and their blood pressure goes high. And then they go back to a stimulant and they do just fine. So it, it's not 100% for everybody. Everybody is different. So um, just because I say the stimulants are stronger and, and risk for more side effects doesn't mean that that will happen to you because everybody is different. But the side effects of, of um, new vigil, pro vigil, it can be a headache, and particularly when you're first starting it, something like 15 or 20 percent of people will get a little bit of a headache. It shouldn't be a whopper, but it should be just a little bit in the frontal lobe. And because of that, we have people start with half a dose and work up over a couple of days because it affects the brain. Even though it's pointed in its action in the hypothalamus, it's still affecting the whole brain. And you can get mood changes. Um, and again, I've had some people get just really depressed. That's not common but you can absolutely get mood changes with any of these medications because they're working on the brain and the brain is, dictates how we behave. 
I, I, so I always ask about mood when I'm seeing people. And the one thing I always um, tell people, because this can be really serious, rare, but serious, is with these medications, these two in particular, armadafinil, modafinil, or nubigil and provigil, you can get Stevens-Johnson syndrome, and that's where the skin starts peeling off, and it can just really get out of hand. So I always tell people, if you're starting one of these medications, if you get um, you know, your skin peeling or sores on your mouth, just stop it immediately and let me know. And then same kind of profile of high heart rate, high blood pressure, palpitations, and if you, if you take it too late in the day perhaps, or if your body just takes longer to clear it, you might get insomnia at nighttime. And I want to make this point because it's so, so important that these medications only work when you have motivation to stay awake. And what I mean by that is that you're telling your body, you're giving your body the, the cues that it's supposed to be awake. So if you, if you take your medicine and then you go back to bed, you're telling your body it's okay to sleep. So that will override the benefit of the stimulant a lot of times. What you have to do is telling your body it's time to be awake. So you have to be standing up or sitting up. Laying down is really, really dangerous if you're sleepy, even with these medications. Dangerous meaning you'll fall asleep. And then you've got to be upright. You know, like teachers always say sit upright because that helps alertness, but that's just telling your body it's time to be awake. Um, it's, it works better when you're engaged in activities. When you're engaged, it just, it just focuses your brain on something and it can suppress the sleepiness. But if you're kind of a passive participant in something like a meeting at work, um, school, or something where you're not actively giving the presentation, these medicines, they help a lot, but sometimes you still have to sit up or chew gum or drink water or things like that. It's not a light switch was my kind of point that you don't take these and then all of a sudden you feel great and you're alert. It works with your body and you have to tell your body it's time to be awake. Otherwise you can override the benefits of these medicines. I think that's a big misconception, at least in the population I see, that you know, you're gonna take this and it's gonna be perfect and it, it's not perfect. And it has a lot to do with how, how you're presenting yourself to the medicine, I guess, you know, that you, you wanna help it work as opposed to making or fighting it by laying down. So now we're on to the new. Th those are the old. Now we're on to the new. And I put the brand name and the generic name up because it's so confusing, I know, to know which medicine is what. And again, like Claire said in the beginning, we're not promoting any, any particular medicine or anything. I'm just putting the names up so you can get it straight in your brain what, what these medicines are. So one of the new ones is called Sunosi is the brand name and Solriamphetol is the generic. It was FDA approved last August. And going back to the picture of the brain, this one not only works with the green here with the dopamine, but it also works with the norepinephrine, which is this other pathway. And so it hits two different pathways in the brain that have the same goal of alertness. It's categorized as a, it's called a DNRI, and that stands for dopamine and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. You know, similar to like SSRI, that selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, it's like a class of medications. This is the class of medications this is in. So dopamine and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. And during the studies to get it approved, they measured alertness for nine hours. They, they didn't measure beyond that. That was just the research protocol. And for those nine hours, the alertness was sustained for the whole time. So no, no dips. Side effects are very similar to any of these wake promoting medicines, headache, nausea, any of these can cause anxiety, decreased appetite and insomnia. And the dose for narcolepsy is 150 milligrams a day. There is a 75 milligram tablet. That one was FDA approved for sleepiness with obstructive sleep apnea. So there's the 75 milligram tablet and then a 150 milligram tablet, but the 150 is the one um, that we use mostly for narcolepsy. This is really important here. The, the synosi or solariamphetol is cleared through the kidney, not the liver. So like those medicines we talked about before that interfere with birth control, this one won't because it's cleared through the kidney. It does not hurt the kidney. The kidney just clears it out. If your kidney doesn't work 100%, it just means we have to adjust the dose downward of the synosi so it doesn't build up and you don't get like 
basically overdosed if it's not cleared out. So again, it does not hurt the kidney. It just is cleared through the kidney and it does not interact with birth control or all those other medicines that are cleared through the liver, which is really important and very nice. Okay, moving on to Pitolisa, which the brand name is Wakex. This is a histamine-based treatment, which is really, really exciting because it's hitting a, a, a novel pathway, this histamine here in the blue. So we're hitting a, a different way to stimulate this pathway to alertness. It's the first of its kind. It has been out in Europe since 2016, but it was FDA approved in last year, the same time as Sunosi actually. And it was FDA approved for sleepiness. It has not been FDA approved for cataplexy. It might be someday, but it's not. In Europe, it was used for cataplexy as well to improve cataplexy. Um, it does have its own specialty pharmacy, not because it's like Zyre, like it's really highly controlled. It's just how it's set up. And so they, they distribute it. You can't go to like, you know, your local pharmacy and get it. It comes to this pharmacy. And the dose, just so you hear it, it starts with 4.5 milligrams and you take two tablets for a week. And then you move up to 17.8 milligrams for a week. And then you go up to 35.6 milligrams. And I know the points, the, the, the numbers are funny. Like they're not just flat numbers, but um, this is how it is. So this is the typical regimen that we use. This is cleared through the liver, however, and it can interact with some medications and require adjustments. We talked about Pitolisin or Wakex decreasing the birth control hormones, which is really, really important to know. And there's some other interactions that are listed on the package insert, but to give you an example, um, Pitolisin dose may need to be decreased when it's combined with bupropion. Bupropion is also called Wellbutrin because it, it'll build up. And then if you stop the Wellbutrin in that same person, you might need to increase the Pitolisin to get the same effect. So, you know, we're, I'm always checking the cross reactions and the interactions to make sure we don't need to increase or decrease, but that's just something to be aware of with Pitolisin. And then the other thing, this is, this is not common. And when it does do this, it's very, very, it's not a big deal. It's a very, very short lived thing, but it can prolong the QT interval and usually people don't know what QT interval is unless you have a QT interval problem. So QT interval is an EKG finding where uh, between uh, the, the QT, those are parts of the EKG wave, it just gets longer than it should and it can you know, predispose you to more arrhythmias. So th the reason I'm bringing this up is if you combine it with other medications that can prolong the QT interval, it might increase the chance of that. This is not to be scary or anything. This is just to tell you if you have a history of QT interval problems, and a lot of times those are um, genetic and things like that. Um, what, what I do is just get an EKG if I have any question about it and see if the QT interval is normal. And if you have another medication that can prolong the QT interval, that doesn't mean that you can't use this. It just means that you might get an EKG once you've started treatment. And this is just the the reminder, same slide as before, that the modafinil, which is Provigil, our modafinil, new vigil, and Wakex, which is Pitolisin, and activate oral and subdermal contraception. I can't stress that enough. And so this is kind of just bringing it all together that now we kind of understand, hopefully, why I showed this slide, that there's different pathways to alertness, and we can't, from the gate, guess which one someone's going to respond best to or which one people are going to have more side effects with at this point in time but perhaps someday we'll get to that individualized medication therapy so maybe we'll be able to you know do a scan or do a blood test and, and realize what is deficient and what what medicine might be best and then coffee coffee is used a lot by people as a stimulant whether they have narcolepsy or not. And it's interesting how it works. And I just wanted to tell you this in case you've heard of this word adenosine. Adenosine is something that builds up in your body as the day goes on and it correlates with how sleepy you are. Caffeine works by blocking adenosine and that's what causes its alertness. It's effective for some people and I've got 
a few handful of people that have used caffeine only because like they'll take a caffeine pill instead of a stimulant because they do so much better with the caffeine pill and have less side effects. Um, of course, don't wanna to take too much caffeine um, and it's typically not prescribed, but if someone needs this, I always talk about limits and what to not go over in a day and just to watch out for the fast heart rate and mood changes and things like that. Just avoid energy drinks, that's all I can say. They're so bad for your system and people resort to them because they're desperate. I mean, they're desperate to feel alert. And oftentimes they might take two or three in a day and that can be a reflection of how sleepy they are. You know, it's, it's just, they reach for them because they're, they're dangerously sleepy and they don't know what's wrong. Once they get a diagnosis, then of course, we tell them to stop the energy drinks and replace it with prescription medication. Then I wanted to touch on cataplexy just itself. The ones we talked about before were more about daytime sleepiness and increasing alertness. But again, what are your goals? What do you want to improve? So cataplexy can be very embarrassing and even disabling in some people. In the United States, there's only one FDA-approved medication for cataplexy, and that is Xyrem, that's sodium oxabate. However, most of the time, we use others, other medications that are off-label, and there, th here's a list of them. SSRIs, things like fluoxetine, um, like that, that's a huge category of medications, but any of them can help, but the classic one is fluoxetine, it's, and you typically have to use higher doses than typical, like sometimes up to 60 and 80 milligrams in order to suppress the cataplexy. The SNRI, um, venlafaxine, um, Effexor is the brand name for that, is really, really effective. Uh, and the dose, what I've seen is it totally depends on the dose. There's been a lot of people that I see in clinic that get a lot of benefit from lower doses, but you just increase it until the cataplexy is controlled or until you get side effects. Tricyclics have been around longer than any of the newer, fancier medicines. They have a lot more side effects just because they're older, but they're effective for cataplexy. And then Stratera or Atomoxetine is a medication that is, um, works through norepinephrine and that can work for cataplexy as well. Just a reminder that the norepinephrine is part of this whole system. Okay, I wanted to talk about sodium oxabate. The brand name that is out right now is called Xyrem. Xyrem is a medication that is to be used in the proper situation for the right patient. It's not for everybody, but it can definitely be a game changer for people that are in the right situation that need it. It is a liquid medication, so that's kind of weird and that's kind of different for people to, to think about. It comes in a, this looks like a cough medicine bottle or something like that, and then you, you have a syringe and you, you, you draw up the amount of the dose you're on. You prepare two different doses because you take one in the middle of the night, and then you take it as you're getting into bed, to, getting into bed because it's so rapidly absorbed by the body. So it's not a pill and it's twice a night and it's liquid, so there's some unconventional things about it, but it can be very effective. With the sodium oxabate, one of the key is that you, you want to be with it when you're preparing the doses. So that's why it's recommended to prepare both doses before bedtime, because you don't wanna be fumbling around in the middle of the night, maybe still under the influence of the first dose while you're trying to prepare the second dose. So you always have the doses ready and then when you take it, you are to be in bed, laying down, take the medication, lay down, and go to sleep. It hits really, really quickly. And if you try to fight it, just like the, the other medicines we talked about, if you fight it, you can override to some extent the, the sleepiness properties of this, but you'll feel really, really crummy and nauseous and just like yuck. So we tell people to lay down, take the medication, and allow it to work. So again, you're telling your body it's time to go to sleep. It's quiet, it's dark, it's cool, your eyes are closed, your body's laying down. And then because the medication is short-lived and you have to reach a certain dose of the medicine in order for it to be effective for cataplexy the next day, it needs to be divided into two doses oftentimes, not 100% of the time, but the second dose you take anywhere two and a half to four hours after the initial dose, 
and that really freaks people out at first saying i have to wake up to take a medication to stay asleep and um, but once you're on it it makes more sense so you take the second dose and then again if you have to go to the bathroom or whatever you go to the bathroom first before taking the second dose um, if you have to let the dog out you do that first and then you only take the dose when you're in bed and ready to lie down and go to sleep. This is a, okay, this is a, a graph of Xyrem. The highest recommended dose is nine grams per night and it's divided between two doses. What I wanna show you on this is this is like the first dose of the, of the nine gram um, dose. Look how quickly it increases in the bloodstream. You take it here and just within minutes, it's peaked up here. And then because it's so short lived, it goes down, but not down to the bottom, not down to zero. And then the second dose, it makes it peak even higher. So it builds on itself and then it goes back down. The orangey color here is half dose. And the point of the slide is that half dose doesn't equal half level in your body. Even if you double the dose, it it exponentially increases. So it's not like a linear progression of two milligrams is twice as strong as one milligrams, two or grams, two grams is way stronger than one gram. For uh, United States is FDA approved for sleepiness and cataplexy associated with, with narcolepsy. Highly controlled is, gam is GHB, which is potentially drug of abuse if it gets in the wrong hands. It's liquid is dosed twice per night. The unique property is helping you wake up feeling rested, which is different than any sort of sleeping pill. Typically, sleeping pills will often help people sleep through the night, but not help them wake up feel rested. This helps people wake up feeling rested. There is, um, FDA is approving a low sodium alternative to sodium oxabate. It's in the process of going through that approval right now. And up here, if you can see my pointer, it's under the 92%. It has 92% less sodium than Xyrem. So this will be great for people that have high blood pressure or get a lot of swelling or have heart disease or liver disease. It'll be much more gentle on your system. Okay, and then a different company is working on a, a once nightly form of sodium oxabate, which I know a lot of people are really excited about. And then lastly, there is a new medicine on the verge, and the, the drug companies here that's gonna talk about it later in much more detail, and I just got two slides on it, and this is off of that uh, Takeda site. This is a representation on the left of a healthy control of the neurons that make hypocretin or orexin. In narcolepsy type one, those neurons are gone. So if you go over here, these are the receptors for the hypocretin and orexin. You still have the receptors, but you don't have the orexin or hypocretin to, to bind with the receptors. And then on the right side, you see the neuron, this is what we need for the downstream effect of alertness. So if you cancel out this, you really have a, under-functioning alertness system. And so the, the hope is that there's an agonist, which means that it could bind to these receptors and have the same properties as the orexin or hypocretin. And I'll let Takeda um, talk about this later, but there's a timeline. Hopefully there's some studies out now, the early studies, and hopefully they, um, the research will, will move quickly because I know this is really an exciting exciting thing to happen to this field. And any questions? Thank you, Suzanne, for, um, I love the slides. What a great um, kind of visual, pro oh, so many visual prompts you've given us to, for us to remember with the content as well. Uh, we do have some questions actually we've got quite a few so i'm just going to try and pick the ones that might be most salient for um the purpose of the audience um firstly are there any studies on the long-term use of xyrem okay so it's i finished fellowship about <clears throat> 
20 years ago. And at that time, they were just bringing it on the market. So it's it's been FDA approved, I believe, for about 20 years. And I'm not sure if they have published. Um, the medical science liaison, I believe, is here for that company. He might be able to answer, um, or you can text me the answer, that the liaison, if you know what it is. But I have plenty of people that have been on it long term and not had any side effects, but I don't know if that's been published in literature. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, why do stimulants slash modafinil cause anxiety in some people? Okay, anxiety is a state that is almost incompatible with sleepiness. So anxiety is kind of a hyper arousal sort of state. And so, and this is not true 100% across the board, but it's hard to be sleepy when you're anxious. And so that is part of the alerting system. It's just alert, the alerting system out of control. If we're enhancing that alerting system and you're prone to anxiety, then you can develop anxiety. And if that happens, we either lower the dose or try a different medication. It's just all part of that alerting system. Thank you. Um, another question. I would love it if Dr. Stevens would touch on what medications for narcolepsy are safe to use during pregnancy and breastfeeding. That is the million dollar question. And I've had many young females get pregnant and we go through this. And the, the answer that is recommended by our academy, of course, is no medications. And that's nearly impossible for a lot of people. But if you have the ability to either adjust your lifestyle, get work accommodations on file, so maybe you can take naps during the day instead of being on medication, or if you can get by with a cup of coffee, a cup or two of coffee a day, not three or four or five or six, because the higher doses of caffeine can be associated with lower birth weight babies, and lower birth weight babies have more trouble. So you don't want a lot of caffeine. You can drink a little bit of caffeine, and then make accommodations in your lifestyle. If napping is something that helps you in particular, doesn't help everybody, but if you can have accommodations for that and do that, and then, of course, protect your sleep at nighttime, avoid sleep deprivation, because any sort of sleep deprivation is going to spill over to the next day and make your alertness worse. So that being said, you have to be practical, and you have to balance the risks and benefits of everything. You don't want someone who's pregnant having a car wreck and hurting themselves or hurting the baby because they're so sleepy, but they've got to drive to work. So if that's the case, there is um, data on Ritalin. It's, it's been a long, long time. And we try to do lowest doses in the smallest intervals we can. So it's all about controlling the exposure of the fetus. If driving is your worst time of day, you can take a small dose in the morning, a small dose in the evening if you need it. Um, you can have it on hand. Some days you don't, might not need it, other days you might need it. As far as things like new vigil, there is a registry, pregnancy registry for that. And there was some data that came out last year from a Canadian registry that it, it's the first time I've heard this but it, it was 13% associated 13% more with birth defects than other medications, which was stunning, you know, because it doesn't, you just, you just never know. Um, but on the other hand, anecdotally, I've had people who had to be on these medications during pregnancy do just fine. And the breastfeeding, same, same concept, minimize the exposure to the fetus, risk benefit, there is a, a, a concept of pump and dump where if you take, say you have to take a 10 milligram Ritalin in the morning, but it's short acting, you can pump the milk in that, after that three or four hours and then dump it so the baby doesn't get exposed to the stimulant because it's metabolized during that time and you can dump that milk. It's a tough one. Yeah, that's really helpful. I think that's come up quite a lot, actually, Suzanne, in our pregnancy and parenting support group. So um, um, I'll actually send them this uh, video once it's, uh, we've got it sorted to them, because I think it's going to address a lot of other questions that some of our community face. Okay, I have another question for you. I think we've got a little bit of time. Can you give more info on how stimulants impact exercising? I've been on Adderall for a long time but my doc is reducing my meds because she feels my last doc had me over medicated. I've always felt like no matter what I do, I cannot exercise to the level I want. Progress is very slow. I cannot seem to run without feeling overly exhausted. It feels like it's impossible for me beyond eight to 10 minutes at a time. 
no longer how uh, no matter how long I work at it so the question is can you give more info on how stimulants impact exercise can, some people do fine with stimulants, but a lot of people find that their heart rate, like their maximum heart rate, just shoots up. And then that means your body's working harder, so that means the duration is going to be shorter. Now, with narcolepsy or sleepiness issues, duration or fatigability is an issue to begin with because it's almost like you've got this, this amount of energy or this amount of alertness during the daytime, you know, and if you, if you overextend that, it's almost like you're stealing from the next day sometimes. So there are some issues with hypersomnias themselves, and that might be hard for you to like, like weed out from whether it's the medication or whether it's the narcolepsy itself. But the stimulants, I just, I worry that they, they make your heart work harder and it's not to say avoid them when you exercise because many people do well, but if you can keep track of your heart rate just to make sure it doesn't go too high, um, if you can limit it to where it needs to go, and sometimes we have to use medications to do that, it might increase your endurance, but that's only if it is going too high. Thank you. Um, next question. Do you know the sodium content of the Avidel Medication, new medication from or yeah. Avidel alternative. Sorry. Uh, oh, oh, the Avidel. Avidel yeah. is the once nightly. My understanding is it's the same. I, now, they if someone has an, another information, please tell me. But I, I'm pretty sure it's sodium oxabate. You know, um, with the sodium on it. Okay, that actually leads to uh, the next question then. Do you think that the low sodium xyron will cause less side effects? Oh, oh time will tell. Now, I, you know, the, the whole purpose is to have less sodium in your body and those side effects like swelling or pushing your heart, if people are prone to heart failure, pushing them into heart failure or the high hypertension, we're assuming those are going to get better. Um, we'll tell with time. Now, the other side effects like, for example, tremor. Some people get a tremor with Xyrem. I don't know. Um, the mood changes, you know, again, anything that affects the brain can affect mood and behavior. So I think the mood issues will still be there and the most common ones being depression or anxiety. Um, other side effects, you know, like sleepwalking perhaps or bedwetting, I, uh, the, I, I don't know. I think it's going to be the same other than just low sodium and whatever problems the low sodium brings with it will be improved. Like the swelling in the morning, a lot of people get swollen hands in the morning, you know, that improves as the day goes on. And sometimes we even have to give a diuretic to combat the swelling due to the sodium and the sodium oxabate. So it might be a cleaner drug. Mm -hmm.